The world is full of people who just want to live their mindless, mediocre lives. Wake up, get a job, spit out some kids, and hopefully live a happy, somewhat fulfilled life before eventually dropping dead. Then there's a sick percentage of the population that, mind you, accounts for less than 1% of the car industry. There's hot rodders. Then beyond that, there's racers. And beyond that, they're the sick freaks who self-identify as engine guys. The latter tends to come with some eccentricity. And if you've ever lived in the life, even for one day, you'd be crazy too. I've been obsessed with engines for the better part of 10 years now. And the general public has no idea what actually goes into the work we do. I put together a humble machine shop in my two-car garage. And with some ingenuity and experience, I can do the same thing the big guys can. I'm here to give you a real look at what we do and why we do it. My name is Josh. I'm an engine machinist. This is Engine Rehab. It's been a long two months. I know you've missed me. I've missed you too. Don't you worry about where I've been. That's between me and my PO officer. What I will say, in the past two months, I've had a lot of time to reflect on myself and really refresh my mind. Gotta say, that California correction system's really good for repeat offenders. So let's get to it. Now I've got an older 302 head sitting here. This was worked on by a friend of mine. Unfortunately, it was a comeback. He had a couple problems, so let's figure out what was going on. So now, like most of us, it's probably no secret, we all appreciate a nice handful. Except this isn't exactly what we're talking about. Uh, this thing has a number of problems. Let's start here. So this is an early small block Ford. It came with press fit rocker studs, uh, just like the small block Chevys. These things can get worn out and then the studs will end up pulling out of their holes. Uh, and that's not so great, especially when you've got to maintain a lifter preload and, you know, open valves and whatnot. So these have already been pulled out. I'll show you what they look like maybe right here. You know, focus! So that's a press fit rocker stud. Uh, that's fine for a stock deal, but by the time these things have been, uh, been around the block once or twice, you know, they're almost 50 years old at this point. The holes get worn out, they'll pull out, you can go and replace them with a new press fit stud, but it probably won't work. We need to machine this for a screw in stud, uh, which means we've got to cut about 375, 400 thousandths off the top of these pedestals. Uh, that's a pretty easy setup. On top of that, the guides got knurled. Now, unfortunately, these heads never should have left my buddy's shop like this, but he didn't know. This was done by one of his shop monkeys. And what do you do when you hire trained, competent employees? You trust them to do their job. Well, that kind of backfired this time around. That's a conversation for a different day. I'm not really all that interested in talking about shop politics and deciding who you can and can't love. We'll bore this out for a bronze guideliner, get that reamed and honed for the proper clearance, and then I haven't decided yet, but I may or may not redo the valve job for him. Now, let's give this a quick flip. Oh, that's not that heavy, but I am a lazy man, if anything. This valve job's not any good. Uh, it's pretty clear that it wasn't sealing. A little shiny area, that's just a, uh, you know, that's a razor edge. That's probably not what you want holding your engine together. Now, another thing, hard seats got installed in this and a proper valve job was not machined into the valve seat. And I do suspect that this is the valve seat exactly as it came out of the box and this 45 was never machined in after the install. We're gonna have to take care of that, or at least my buddy will. We'll figure that out by the end of the video. But that straight 45, it's not gonna work. It's not even the right angle. You can see the shiny areas right on the bottom. You can see the same thing on the valves. This really isn't even the worst cylinder. I just looked over here and this exhaust seat was not very happy. And that 45 is what, a hundred thousandths wide? That little razor edge, I could cut you. It's not good. 
So let's go ahead, get this deburred. We'll put it in the milling machine. I'll show you what I do to do screw and stud conversions. Um, I've already done one cylinder head, as I explained earlier, and it came out pretty good. We're going to do our best to preserve their original garbage setup that used a uh, pivot ball, a lot like factory, and a self-aligning rocker. Uh, this pedestal was cut down about a hair over 400 thousandths to get to this height. Uh, I did set it up to where the owner of the vehicle can switch to a guide plate and more modern rocker arm design. Threads got machined for 7 16 This is a 3 8 top. He would be able to upgrade to a 7 16 top and really increase the uh, stability in the whole setup. Another thing we're going to do is we're going to machine down these spring pads to accept an LS valve spring. Uh, the LS valve spring is really good for flat tap head applications, which is what this thing is. And the original failure was a flat tap head failure. The owner of the vehicle swore it only had an hour of runtime, but based off of the way the parts look and the amount of soot and garbage that's floating around inside of the uh, heads, especially before the cleaning, even this really dark gasket imprint. Yeah, buddy, sure, an hour of runtime. Not my problem. I offered to help, so here we are. I'm helping. Oh, and before I forget, I cleaned all the intake valves, I cleaned all the exhaust valves. I'll show you a clip of how I do it. I actually put them into a tumbler with ceramic media and it does a very good job of smoothing out the valve stems and it deepers all the edges. All that carbon and garbage that builds up on the parts doesn't stand a chance. I'm gonna chuck these up in a drill and just hand polish them. When you tumble a valve and hand polish the stems, they come out really, really great really gives the guides the best chance of survival. And alas, time to move on, because I'm getting real excited thinking about those uh, really sweet valves. You'll notice that I put a washer under all of these studs, and I can't pull that out right now. Uh, these are all torqued and they're permanent. I'm not gonna pull these out. That is to take place of the guide plates, since we're not gonna run guide plates on this. Uh, the head is set up to use self-aligning rockers. The guide plate happens to be the same thickness as those washers, so it's just to keep things nice and neat. There's a big fat corner radius on the bottom of the stud. Uh, if you didn't put that washer on the bottom of the stud, it would actually try to crowd the top of the threads and it would damage the top of the threads. The way to mitigate that is you would put a big old chamfer on the top of the rocker stud hole, but I decided I don't really like that. It looks pretty sloppy in my opinion, so little tiny neat chamfer is all we need and We'll put a washer under it. Even without the washer, you'd have a nice guide plate. So there's the setup. It's a pretty simple thing. I've got braces to help support the cylinder head. I'm gonna use the shank of the bolts to help me indicate the head in so I can get the rocker arm stud center line uh, matched up with the table of my mill. That way I can just center on one hole, then move down the line using measurements. Uh, then I can help correct some of the, uh, any inaccuracies that already exist in this casting. Once that's all done, we'll cut about 400 thousandths off the top of these rocker stands. We'll tap it for a 7 16 course, get the rocker studs installed, and then roll the heads over and we'll machine these for guide liners and for the LS valve spring. You're gonna have to ignore the economical test indicator. I thought it might be fun to see what would happen if I'd chuck my Minitoyo across the room. It's in the shop right now. It'll be back soon.
So we're doing a finish pass now just to clean it up and make everything match. After this, I'll have to come in and chamfer all the holes and I'll have to find center so I can uh, <clears throat> create a datum point. Then I'll use the bore spacing of the engine to uh, move from hole to hole. So we're done now. Let me get this out of the way. Look at that. It looks pretty good. And see, it's a boatload of stock removal. You know, there's some chips down here, but look what's down here. That's like a half inch thick pile. You know, engine building is a lot like inflicting someone with Stockholm Syndrome. You've got to break it down into an empty shell, then just build it back up again. And hopefully by the end, you'll have something that's exactly what you want. Now, here are all the tools that we're using to get the job done. Got the energy drink, as if I'm not anxious enough. We need some thread sealer that'll go onto the threads of the rocker stud. Uh, this is just a random stud I had for a test fit. Uh, gasket scraper, because these heads were filthy. That's for fixturing. Torque wrench, always torque your rocker studs. You know, the good and tight method's fine, but 45 foot pounds, that's what most rocker studs go to. Uh, this is the collet for the spiral fluted uh, reduced height tap that I use. Uh, this is what we'll be using for cutting the spring pads. Uh, you know, simple tools for setup, you know, calipers and uh, a deck bridge is also really good on Fords. You can set the deck bridge on the valve cover rail and then use that to touch off on your rocker pedestal and then that helps you reference the heights from head to head. And of course, came over here to grab the drill. It's got a little tiny chamfer chucked up in it. Uh, this is a drill I've actually had for maybe five or six years and the, it needs a trigger. There's nothing else wrong with it. I really preferred the DeWalt's up until recently where I started buying all those little cocky drills. So, simple deal. Moderate pressure. That's probably a little bit more chamfer than I want. Just like that. This is a rigid tapping operation. So once the backside of the tap goes past the top of the hole, I can stop and reverse the tap and I'll be at full depth. So this will go pretty fast. I'm in low gear. I'm going about 90 RPM. But taps don't turn backwards. Wish me luck. It goes quite fast. I'm almost there. Now, we need to reverse. I'm not using any lube on the tap. You don't necessarily need to use any type of cutting oil or lube, lube on cast iron. Um, I might wipe a little bit of ARP on this, but it's not exactly necessary. Let's turn the speed up. Here we go. That easy. We've got access to multiple sets of these ARP rocker studs with a 3 8 top. They're not good for a whole lot, but they're okay for these stalker flat tappet deals. So let's get some thread sealer put on these. Give that a quick break clean. No, I had to go to five different stores to find this stuff today. Whoa, that's too much. Here's a pro tip. If your sealer dries out, you can spray a little bit of brake clean or put some alcohol or acetone into there and you'll uh, be able to thin it out again and make it usable. That's one of the problems with buying the brush on PTFE like this. I learned that like, I don't know. I was like 19. That was a while ago. 
I learned that at my first machine shop job. I hated that job. If my old employers are out there, go eat a bag of pickles. I've already brushed out all these bolt holes, so they're clean, ready to accept the rocker studs. So on the studs where that fillet was machined too large, that actually would keep the studs from sitting down on top of the uh, on top of the washer or on top of the head. So the fact that these washers have a nice chamfer on the top of them is uh, it's quite nice because it's preventing it from being an actual issue. 45 foot pounds. Run them down. And get them torqued. And just to piss off the Chuck Lynch's of the world, let's just double check that. Oh no, they are over torqued. Whatever will I do? I'm gonna go to bed. Tomorrow we'll get these spring pads cut down. We'll get the guide liners installed and sized. I'm still deciding whether or not I'm gonna cut the valve job for this guy. Uh, we'll see. Maybe I'll sleep on it. I was about to go inside, but since I mentioned it, I thought I'd go and explain some of the lore. My first machine shop job was at a production shop in Stockton, California. Well, I stopped working there because one day I got accused of stealing. Well, turns out some homeless guy broke in and stole my employer's son's work bag. They didn't, uh, they never copped up to it, made my life hell. I found a better job in Sonoma County. It was great, learned everything I knew there. I've got one message for them. I'm in Davis. Look at me now, bitch. Go f yourself. Well, it's the next day. Right now we need to get the guides board and install some guide liners. Once that's done, I'll get them sized for him, and then we'll move on to getting the spring pads machined for the new spring pack. And that's actually gonna be pretty cool. I'll show you once we get to that step. So this is the general idea of the setup. I've got everything all indicated in. I did that by putting a pilot inside of the head. I sweeped Z on both sides and then found center. I've got my DRO set to zero. I put the guide liner reamer inside of the bridge port and now I'll go ahead and bore the first hole and then move over to all the rest of them using the valve spacing. One thing I did notice was the valve guides were bored at a slight angle in relation to the rocker studs. So I left everything on the same plane as the rocker studs. I'm going to go ahead and bore it and that'll help correct some of that uh, uh, misalignment. And hopefully that'll mean that this thing will last a little bit longer than it would have otherwise. I tried using the quill feed, I actually don't like it, so we're not gonna use it. I'll just feed it by hand. Seems to be a little bit better on the reamer. The problem with using the quill feed uh, was I found it was cutting a little bit too slowly uh, and that, that could be actually quite hard on the reamer. It's better if it actually makes a real trip. It would be nice if I could find a, nice, a wheel for my quill, but it is what it is. So that's it. Every single one's bored. Good for me. So this is what I'm talking about when I say guide liner. This is a K-Line brand. This comes from SBE International. Really good product, I've been using these for years. These things get a bad rap, but I really think it's just because uh, there are so many people who don't understand how they work, and there's a lot of heads floating around out there that had bad guide liner installs. 
I have never had an issue with a guideliner. Get out of there. That hole was packed full of chips. One of these days I'll clean out this machine and get it uh, repainted and nice looking. I've got this and my rod hone that I need to get clean and repainted. The rod hone's cool, but it's got a bad pump in it. So I've got to get that thing torn apart. That's usually one of those jobs that's reserved for shop monkeys. Unfortunately, I'm not a shop and I'm not allowed to have shop monkeys. Uh, I tend to get in trouble with HR. And since I don't have an HR department, that would be my wife. Let's just wipe a little oil on the inside of the guides. Rather than put oil on the guide liner itself. Hopefully that'll help reduce some of this mess. Honing machines tend to be the messiest of them all. So let's get that shut back off. Cover your ears. Now the last step is we've got to broach the guides. Now this is a ball brooch and my homemade driver. Now the purpose of the ball brooch is to use these ball bearings that are built into the driver and it actually is larger than the inside of the guide liner and then it expands the split in the guide liner into itself and then it locks the guide liner into the board and that's how they're held in into place. The inside dimension of the board hole is very critical. This is the step where they're going to get everything wrong. Either they're not using the correct brooch or the uh, inside diameter of the board holes all screwed up. And what that means is if you're going to have a problem, the engine will be running, the guide liner will slip out, it'll try to go back into its hole and get smashed by the valve spring and get all bent up and that tends to hurt a little bit, maybe ego wise and physically, you know, not, not really good to have a guide fall out. Guys, you know what I'm talking about when it slips out and won't go back in. A little hard to see, but what I did was chamfer the front of that valve guide and it gets that guide liner to blend in with the cast iron really well. So at this point, you've got to just do a quick visual inspection of the valve guides and make sure you didn't crack the top of the valve guide. Uh, these are at 570 usually at an 1130 second stem with a 570 cast iron guide boss you're not going to crack it but when the guide boss ends up being about 530 or smaller there's a high risk of you cracking the top of the valve guide uh, in that case it tends to help to put a little split collar on the top of the valve guide to help support it and keep it from cracking when you're running that brooch through so i don't see any cracks uh, we're cleared to get these guide liners trimmed down. Uh, there's a special tool for that. Nothing really interesting there. And then we'll get it blended in and then it, I'm not gonna spend too much time making it look perfect because we're gonna cut the top of these guide bosses down anyways. That's the tool, it's very simple. It's meant to be run by hand, but I take the T handle off of it and I put them in a drill. And it's just a dowel with a pointed set screw in it. You shove the dowel into the split and then you just spin it and it splits the guide in half. You don't have to worry about hurting the guide. Since they're broached in, it's now permanently installed in the cylinder head. I don't have an 82 degree chamfer, so I just use a three quarter inch burr. And I use that to blend in the top of the valve guide. There's guys that'll just shove these guide liners in, not do any of this finish work and trimming and chamfering, and it just looks like crap. And those are the guys who tend to have problems, but not me. I don't want problems. 
Then lastly, we need to ream the guides for size. I'm going to go in through the top since that's the easiest to access right now. Uh, these are carbide reamers. They're meant specifically for reaming powdered metal and bronze guides. Uh, the pilots fit very tight, so you don't have to worry about running these by hand and getting it crooked. Uh, and then they leave a very, very good finish. And this is the accepted manner for uh, sizing valve guides these days. Um, there are guys who live and die by honing guides. That's really great as well, but this, this is really hard to match. Grab a valve, show you just how good this is. Perfect. It's about a thou three, a thou four. Excuse the lighting. Now over here, these will probably only slip in halfway. Actually, they don't even slip in at all. Sometimes I'll brush the guides after reaming with the diamond hone and just put a nice little cross hatch pattern into the into the guide but I don't think I'll do that this time. The actual instructions from K-Line actually tell you to just keep running bigger and bigger brooches through the guides until you're valves have proper clearance, that's the wrong way to do it. That's how you guarantee that you're gonna have an issue. Uh, broaching them minimally is going to ensure that the guide is nice and straight. If you just broach it, the guide bore will feel good, it'll seem like it has good clearance, but in reality, it's gonna be very wavy and won't, be, won't have good support for your valve. And that is slick. Or I do have the correct honing mandrel installed in my drill right now, so, I'll just give these a very light brush to put a cross hatch into them. Oh look, I was honing Porsches last. Of course I was. One, two, three, four, five. Guide sizing doesn't have to be this big old mystery. Pretty accepting of most things, as long as, as long as you're not knurling your valve guides, I think you're probably going to do okay. Let's get these brushed out so I can show you the difference in the look. Perfect. So there's your reamed valve guides, and this is what it's going to look like and they've been lightly honed. Shine a light in there. Come on. There we go. It's hard to see, but there's a cross hatch in there that'll help promote oil retention. Now, reaming leaves a rough finish, but it's very straight and accurate. So when you do a light brush with the hone, it'll reveal exactly what I'm talking about by a rough finish. If you look at about six o'clock on that middle valve guide, you're gonna see a light shadow. That's just a little bit of a chatter, you know, a little bit of chatter, a little bit of a low spot that'll be left with the reamers. That doesn't mean anything, but that's just something to keep in mind if you're reaming. If you want the finish to be perfectly smooth, then you'll have to hone it enough to remove those uh, imperfections. They don't really mean anything, but something worth, it's worth pointing out. Just as a quick refresher, here's the leaky valve job that was on it before. Pretty sure this is very, very original to the heads. And there's the hard exhaust seats that were installed that had a pre-cut 45 that was never remachined after installation. <sighs> well, I decided to have a heart. We're gonna do the valve job for my buddy. It occurred to me I don't really wanna open up for risk for another problem. Uh, I'm just gonna take care of it. We'll get it 
make sure it's right. I'm only gonna use stones. This thing only needs a basic three angle valve job. I'm very over working on this thing at this point. As much as I'm tired of working on it, it's gotta be right. Goes faster than you think. It would help to turn the power on. Now this is as real as it gets. Try your best not to get enamored by all the cool stuff you see on YouTube. They're not showing you everything that they do. They're only showing you the best of the best. Remember kids, the internet isn't real. All I ask for is for you to do a good job. Well, that's nothing fancy. It's just a good old three angle valve job. Let's get those spring pockets cut. I'm gonna cut this inner step down. It's gonna to go to 562 thousandths. Uh, in addition to that, I'm gonna go down another 50 thousandths in the spring pad. That will allow me to install this OD locator, or a spring cup is what it's also called. And then from there, we'll be able to install an LS valve spring. Oh, now if there's something I was really good at, it's getting a rise out of people on the internet. So wait. I've got one, you've got a good one coming to you. All you expert cylinder head machinists out there. Lo and behold, the infamous drill chuck is back. You know, since we do all of our cylinder head work in a drill press, so they say, nobody gets more angry than internet expert. Why don't you use a collet? Because you can't. That's why. But you wouldn't know that because you don't actually do this for a living. But doing this for a living would probably imply that you're getting paid. Insert meme here. You know, nothing makes you more claustrophobic than trying to film a YouTube video in a two car garage. Okay, so now we've touched off, it's nice and flat. You guys see how quickly that came in so the spring pad wasn't canted or crooked or anything. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna move this quill stop upward. I just, I think what I need to do is I need to cut this down about 80 thousandths and that'll get me my spring height. It's probably not the best idea to assume it's going to fall together. I'm going to give it a little bit of leeway. So I've got some spring shims in here. Uh, this is totaling to about 85 thousandths worth of spring shim. That will give me plenty of leeway. So now that the quill stop is set, I can run this down and cut this to my height. So 80 thousandths. It's not too bad right now, but I usually just let it chatter. These tools are really not that great. But they work for their intended purpose just fine. I don't know what's so polarizing about guide liners and cutting down spring pads. It's real basic stuff, but it kind of just speaks to what the average idiot knows. The valve guides, that was really interesting. The valve guide outside diameter on these older heads is not concentric to the inside diameter of the guide itself. That's very, very common. So what we saw there was the guide only 
uh, cut on one side, but on that other guy, they didn't cut the guide, the seal area on the guide at all. Super common, happens all the time. Not a big deal. After these are all cut down, I'm gonna come in and uh, cut these for a 530 positive seal. Oh, what else? What else pissed people off? That I don't vacuum the chips between each setup. It's not a big deal. Don't worry. Everyone's going to be okay, you guys. You don't need to vacuum the chips every single time you, uh, you drill a hole or uh, mach machine a little section on the part. You can wait until the very end. It's not going to kill anybody. Here, let's get this vacuumed up just real fast. I want to show you the difference between the modified spring pocket and the stock spring pocket. Nice. I've put springs into these kinds of heads so large that they get into the core plugs. Pretty hilarious. So if I was smart, this should drop right in. Yep. Drops right in. Locates fine enough. Everything's going to be okay, you guys. So now I've got a different tool in here. We're going to cut the top of the valve guide down for a 530 valve stem seal. This is, the, this is the step where it all really starts to come together. Looks like a good height there. Looks like I brought that down about 40 thousandths. Nice. Looks very racy. This step is so easy, I'm honestly just eyeballing all of this. Unless you're a complete idiot, you're not going to be so far off center. I'm just eyeballing the pilot, and by feel as I run it down, if I don't feel it hit the valve guide, then I know I'm going to be pretty damn close. Don't be foolish. Always chamfer your holes. It's for your safety and mine. What do you say? I'd say this is a pretty good looking setup. Oh man, probably should have used some lube. Maybe use some lube. Consider that, you guys. Brand new LS3 spring. It needs a little bit better location. The spring locators I have coming should fit that guide a little bit better. It's coming together quite neatly. Hooray. Now listen, I swear there's a madness to the method here. I do wanna show you how well these LS springs uh, package inside of these older engines. Uh, so I'm just gonna put one spring on and you'll see. I know I've done this before, once or twice, once or thrice. Now, quickly, there's no such thing as a good pneumatic spring compressor, so they're all pretty much garbage. All right. Now, I bet there's some machinists out there that'll find that comment quite offensive, but you know it's true. Pretty much, these pneumatic spring compressors are only good for uh, 
stock type of spring pressures. Low performance garbage. All right, let's show you this. Woo. Now that looks quite good. Let's rotate that. Oh, I can't even rotate this thing. There we go. Got the nice pink stripe. That looks legit. Where's that stock spring? I know what I'd rather have. That's more better. Nice beehive. Okay, last step. I was debating on whether or not I even wanted to do this since this is literally a freebie. <laughs> friends helping friends, what can you do? Uh, I've got to polish the valve stems. Uh, after that, we'll put a quick grind on these valves and then I'll go and drop these heads off. Now the valve stem polishing is really quite simple. I'm just chucking the valve up in my drill and I've got this worn out piece of emery cloth. And I wrap them. I wrap the emery cloth around the valve stem and I pinch it. These valve stems are a little bit on the softer side, so I'm using emery cloth. A lot of times I can just use uh, Scotch-Brite or something a little less aggressive. But the purpose of that is to smooth out the surface and knock down any burrs. Uh, the tumbler does a really good job of knocking off any burrs, but this is the first thing that happens before this even goes in my valve grinder. Uh, it only takes one little burr or a high spot to screw up your uh, valve phase concentricity. I'm, I'm, I'm over this. I just want to get this thing done. I gotta say, these are coming out very, very good. My valve grinder is from 1968. And normally, a grinder this old would be very relevant. But mine's been completely gone through and I've modified it quite a bit. I've got a very, very nice collet chuck in here. It uses ER32 collets. By my standards, I know if I hold two to three ten thousandths on a valve, I'm going to be very ecstatic. I'm also a stickler for the uh, surface finishes. Wow. Pretty. Let's give you a close up. Now that is a properly machined intake valve. Look at that. Now, another thing worth noting, uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to show you on this last valve. It's been kind of random, but a lot of these valves were ground at the wrong angle. A handful of these valves were ground at a 46 degree valve face, and we need to be at a 45 degree valve face. That's fairly common, but well, that can have some adverse effects. Interference angles are not a thing anymore, but you'll run into people who still believe in them. And my official stance on this, and I have many friends who believe in the same exact thing, is that valves and seats are so hard anymore that the valve angles need to match. Go figure. These valves grind like butter. You might notice that I wipe the valve off every time I finish grinding them. That's just so I don't make a big mess. 
you walk into a shop, there's a, there's a pretty high chance that you'll find their valve grinder is a train wreck. A lot of times this, these drains and all the open areas are just covered in grinding dust and cement and garbage. And they just, the valve grinders, they, they should be really nice, pretty pieces of machinery. But I don't know what it is, but a lot of machine shops tend to have filthy, disgusting valve grinders. As you can tell, pet peeve. And I promise you, I do have standards. Maybe not right now, but I usually do. Look at that. See that shadow on the back side? This was ground at the incorrect angle. Just like the other one. Oh, you know what? No, I'm wrong. That's where the previous valve job was set and then the guy lapped the crap out of the valve and wore a giant ass groove into the face of the valve. Let's get that ground out. Okay. Once you hear it, once you can audibly hear the valve uh, finish grinding, then you can pull the stone away from the valve. Same thing. All that erosion, that's from valve lapping. Amazing. Amazingly crap. Beautiful. I'd say that's it. I'm gonna get these loaded up in my car. I got the spring pack set up, new guides installed, did screw and studs, a basic three angle valve job. He's gotta surface this. Get everything cleaned up. I'm gonna tell them exactly where to set the springs up. That was really a boatload of work for just a stock set of small block forward heads. That's pretty normal for me. It's not something I've never done before. I used to do it quite a lot. Uh, lucky enough for you guys, YouTube is pretty much all I'm gonna be doing this year. I was a little bit all over the place. I wasn't exactly sure what direction I wanted to go with this video, but I think I turning it into a, just a repair video was pretty okay. I was talk, gonna talk about politics and whatnot, but yeah, probably a bad idea. I'm already polarizing enough. So I'm gonna call this a repair. Thanks for hanging in till the end. I'll see you next time.